Hello, and welcome to Controlled Pod Into Terrain. We are a multimedia podcast about air and space mishaps, aiming to put them in the broader context of how and why things went wrong. To, to introduce myself and my co-hosts, my name is Ariadne. I'm the business aviation industry experts, and my pronouns are they and them. My name is Jay. I'm the systems and engineering expert, and my pronouns are also they and them. And I'm Kira Dempsey, better known as the aviation writer Admiral Cloudberg, and my pronouns are she and her. Next slide. For this episode, we're going to take you to West Africa in 2003, where a bunch of very shady guys from outside of Africa came in and built the worst airline to ever fly, killed a whole bunch of people, and got off scot-free. But first, we have to do some kind of news thing. Next slide. Da 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 da. All right. Let's do some kind of news thing. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to... Thank you, by the way, to, uh, to the Admiral for, for creating this slide. Um, <laughs> yes, actually, I didn't even come up with it. My friend came, who doesn't even listen to this podcast came up with it, at least part of it. So we're going to start by doing a quick recap on Boeing's issues lately. If you want a more in-depth analysis of the issues facing the 737 MAX and all of the other Boeing airplanes, uh, please take a listen to our recent bonus episode. So we'll start with the 737. Back around Christmas, Boeing had to issue a service bulletin to all airlines to inspect all 737 MAX airplanes for a possible loose bolt in the rudder control system. This came about after an airline discovered a bolt with a missing nut while performing routine maintenance. It's probably for the best that Boeing is paying attention when it comes to the PCU. I mean, that they've not, not had any problems with it in the past or anything, have they? Future episode foreshadowing. Boeing is also trying to have the FAA certify the 737 MAX 10. And one of these sticking points has been the nacelle anti-ice system. The short version of this is that the anti-ice system works by heating the nacelle with bleed air. But because the nacelle is composite, I believe it's a fiberglass, if this bleed air is left on too long when there's no ice, it will make the nacelle brittle and eventually it could, it could possibly crack and come apart. And then rather than fix it with some kind of, I don't know, con contact switch or thermostat or literally anything, Boeing instead just wanted to tell the pilots that they had five minutes after they left icing conditions to turn it off or else they might critically damage the nacelles. And they submitted this process to the FAA under the request that this be their solution until they can install a permanent solution sometime around 2025 or 2026. Yeah, but after the blowout on Alaska 1282, they quietly withdrew the request. So the MAX-10 is not going to get certified until they can get a permanent mechanical solution uh, implemented. And it could be a year or more. So if you listened to our bonus episode, you heard a lot about all of those things. But one thing that's new since we recorded that is we have some of the results of FAA's audit on Boeing. Yeah, a recent audit by the FAA of Boeing has concluded after six weeks, and it's not pretty. The FAA audited 89 different production items and work streams. They passed 56 of the audits and failed 33 of them for an overall grade of 62.9%, uh, if, you're, if you're doing the math. And while that is passing in 100-level English, uh, and the dude that graduates last in medical school still gets to be called doctor, it isn't a soaring success, especially when you're given the answers to the test ahead of time. There are fields where 62.9% is, is not a passing grade, and frankly, this is one of them, so I'm going to call that a fail. Yeah, apparently the FAA found 97 instances of alleged noncompliance, and what noncompliance means is not specified, but probably means, you know, what, 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 what would you call it? Uh, normalization of deviation? Yeah. I'm I'm going to say for sure um my wife you know used to work in in food service um she was a, she was a waitress and a bartender and she would always tell me that the because the criteria for kitchen inspections was published and was very clearly written that restaurants really had no excuse for getting less than 100% um and it really feels like this this should have been something like that uh, spirit aerosystems was also audited they failed eight out of 13. Now, that is a very not passing grade, no matter how you slice it, even in 100 level English. 
I'll read you a couple excerpts from the New York Times article that was written by Mark Walker on the 11th of March, which was our source for all of these numbers. Quote, at one point during the examination, the Air Safety Agency observed mechanics at Spirit using a whole tail key card to check a door seal, according to a document that describes some of the findings. That action was not identified, documented, or called out in the production order. I should note that it's the not documented part that's the big deal here, because checking door seals with a hotel key card could be safe if someone has validated it and written up a procedure for doing it, but that had not been done. Yeah, it's pretty normal to check door fit with a shim or something like that. And in fact, this is how, you know, um, everyone does it, you know, from car companies to the people who assemble your refrigerator at LG City in Korea or, you know, that's how you actually do it. It's normal, but it does need to be documented and approved and the thickness of the hotel key card, as well as the process for running it around the door absolutely does need to be documented because that process is a vital part of the um, the quality system for, for that manufacturing. Yeah. And if you don't do that, hotel key card becomes an accepted unit, unit of measurement. And that's not reassuringly precise because, you know, when you're when you're dealing with things that require a, a certain level of precision, uh, is it cold outside with the key card? Is it a Hilton key card and maybe it's a little thinner? You know, these are these are things that require specific precision and not just whatever you happen to have in your pocket. In another instance, the FAA saw spirit mechanics apply liquid Dawn soap to a door seal, quote, as a lubricant in the fit up process. According to the document, the door seal was cleaned with a wet cheesecloth. The document said, noting that instructions were vague and unclear on what specifications or actions are to be followed or recorded by the mechanic. Same goes here. Anecdotally, Dawn soap is just fine for this task, but it needs to be validated and specified in a procedure. When these kinds of things are done based on a, you know, that should be okay mindset, even if they are okay, then you don't have a barrier against slippage. You don't have a barrier against someone using Dawn ultra high power deep cleansing acid wash dish soap that dissolves rubber. I mean, this is actually a thing that can happen. Um, rubber is fundamentally tree sap. And some soaps actually have enough glycerol in them that they can make rubber tacky. And then when it dries out, it sticks together. And, you know, obviously this is this is a problem um, for your quality management system, which is apparently a term that Boeing just doesn't understand. OK, yeah. Next slide. OK, my notes say United gets kind of screwed by probability. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, United Airlines has had what can only be described as a no good, very bad few days earlier this month. None of the incidents were serious. None of them resulted in any injury, uh, any hull losses or even any sort of severe mechanical damage. So we'll just kind of go through the rapid fire, rapid engine fire, one might say. All right, so on March 4th, a 737 out of Houston Bush experienced an engine fire on the way to Fort Myers, probably their punishment for trying to go to Florida. They extinguished the fire and proceeded onwards. Now, normally this would not warrant discussion, but there was something about their explanation that kind of caught our eye. Um, so they claim this was caused by bubble wrap being ingested into the engine. Now, I didn't think this passed the smell test, you know, just immediately because bubble wrap is made of polyethylene, which is basically just congealed jet fuel. And this was a 379, um, which means it has a CFM 56. The operating temperatures on these engines are around 800 to 900 degrees C. Um, obviously, all of the air and any bubble wrap that gets sucked into the engine has to go through the compressor first. And of course, the compressor makes this very hot. And of course, again, if this bubble wrap had gone through the bypass duct, then obviously it wouldn't be causing engine fires. It would just go straight through. So the bleed air temperatures and pressures from the engine's compressor, 14th stage, um, change with engine power settings, but the temperatures and pressures can reach 510 degrees C and 15 bar um, when you're at toga power. Um, at cruise, it's actually not that much less. 
And the melting point for average commercial low density polyethylene is typically between 105 to like 115 degrees C. So it is my contention that you could feed an entire 15 pound roll of Uline bubble wrap into a CFM 56 at cruise without retuning it. And I don't think you'd even have a noticeable effect on the exhaust gas temperature. So I don't know what exactly happened here, but that story doesn't seem like it's right to me. So, and I, I mean the other way, because all indications are that this was a compressor stall, which is the result of a disruption to the natural balance of air flows and pressures within the engine, not necessarily mechanical damage. And this results in dramatic flames due to incomplete combustion, but it's not always even fatal to the engine. So there are a couple of ways I think bubble wrap could cause a compressor stall, assuming in either case, the quantity of bubble wrap was fairly large. So first, a large amount of partially melted poly polyethylene could adhere somewhere in the compressor stages. It wouldn't take much material to disrupt the airflow enough to cause a surge at takeoff power. And if the compressor pressure drops even a little with the engine at toga, then the combustion chamber pressure will exceed the surge line and air will explosively burst forward through the compressors. Alternatively, if a whole bunch of highly flammable polyethylene made it through the combustion chamber and ignited, that could increase combustion chamber pressure above the surge threshold, and then the result is the same. So these are my amateur theories, but they're both consistent with everything I know about engine operation and bubble wrap. Yeah, and the, the disagreement I had with that um, is that both would be transient, right? Since the fire shooting forwards into the compressor would be well above the melting point of polyethylene if it got stuck there. And if it was going backwards through the engine core, then it would get burned off really quickly. But if the initial overpressure event damaged the compressor blades and the surging would become self-sustaining at that power setting, regardless of whether the initiating material is still present... So this could, this could have kept going by itself until the crew reduced power. Mm, I still don't buy it. Uh, agree to disagree, I guess. <laughs> well, it's really a pity that we probably won't ever get to see the investigation results, because this is almost certainly going to be internal to CFM. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm glad there's some debate on this. Next slide. On March 8th, a wheel fell off the 777 on its way to Osaka while it was taking off from 10 right, 28 left on at SFO, uh, falling into the parking lot and absolutely totaling someone's Corolla. Thankfully, they were not in that car. Uh, for that matter, thankfully, this thing managed to find a spot uh, where it couldn't hit anything uh, that, that anything couldn't be. Anything else. <laughs> yeah, it, could, it, it, it didn't find a person, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, we have uh, on the screen up here on the left, we have a diagram of uh, what we think is probably the, the best guess for the impact point. Um, you can see in the bottom right, the, the wheel actually falling off of the aircraft. Um, and up in the upper right, we have a San Mateo PD car that responded. Uh, he's currently trying to figure out how he can kneel on the tire's neck. Next slide. Also on the 8th, uh, an A320 had to return to LAX after one of its hydraulic systems reported a failure. Um, it's only one of three systems. Each one can do the, can do the job of all three. So this is not really a big deal. Next slide. Also, also on the 8th, a 37 MAX 8 at Houston Bush went off the runway. Um, it was coming from Memphis. It was landing on 27, and it was wet. ETC ordered them to turn off at the Sierra Charlie Taxiway. We actually have a little diagram up here in the corner for you. Um, they went wide into the ditch, which looks like it broke the left main landing gear. Um, that shut down operations on that runway for two weeks, uh, which is pretty severe, while they uh, they salvaged the aircraft. So air traffic control told them to expedite their exit from the runway. So th and then they took a 90 degree exit at 30 knots ground speed. And the speed limit for a 90 degree exit in the wet is 10 knots. So the result was predictable, let's just say. Yeah, I think that the, the NTB speed report on this one's probably about eight sentences long. Next slide. Okay. On March 11th, a United flight from Sydney to SFO had to return to Sydney when they had a, a hydraulic leak from the left main gear, um, probably from the actuator that tilts the wheels. Yeah, it's actually this neat little mechanism that tilts the whole bogey like it's a car doing a wheelie so that the plane can touch down more gradually. Uh, but in this case, it 
sort of pissed Skydroll 500B-4 all over the runway at Sydney, and that is exceedingly unpleasant stuff, as well as being you know, corrosive and dissolving rubber and dissolving paint and dissolving uh, ramp agents and um, generally being unpleasant. It's also extremely slippery, so you need to get it off the runway. But all in all, you know, not really a huge deal, um, just a unpleasant cleanup problem. All right, next slide. This is our last one. Finally, as of the writing of this segment, on March 15th, a United uh, 378 from SFO had a section of composite fairing for the right side landing gear completely detach in flight. Um, now, all of these incidents are fine in isolation. None of them corresponded to anything serious. None even had minor injuries. Um, it doesn't necessarily indicate anything systemic. Uh, taken together, it's not a great look for United, certainly. Yeah, it could be a coincidence, or, you know, it might not be. I was asked for comment about this by the New York Times, and what I said first was that this series of incidents is being falsely conflated with Boeing's troubles. And second, even so, it's not great for United, but there isn't really evidence of incidents on the whole being on the rise. We don't even know if this is because something was actually wrong at United or if they were just unlucky. My take on it is it's probably... It's maybe probably nothing. <laughs> they operate thousands upon thousands of flights, for sure. Okay. Yeah, this is, and I'd like to point out, this is not even the first time that an American airliner has had a wheel fall off in the last few months. Uh, a few months ago, it happened on a Delta 757 on the runway. One of the nose wheels apparently just decided to go off and have an adventure. So, bad luck for United. All right, next slide. So, LATAM Airlines Flight 800, first number, don't know why we let anybody have that one. It was flying from Sydney to Auckland on its way to Santiago, which is kind of an interesting, what's called a fifth freedom flight plan. Um, it means it was allowed to stop on the way for fuel, but it's also allowed to pick up new passengers. Um, at some point after reaching cruise altitude, the aircraft encountered an upset of some kind and fell approximately 300 feet in a few seconds. There were 50 injuries, reports of cuts and bruises, head and neck injuries, broken bones. The flight crew uh, decided to continue the flight to Auckland. Twelve people on the flight were treated in hospitals. Apparently one was in fairly serious condition. Um, at that point, the passengers... Uh, stayed the night in Auckland, and the aircraft, they, they traveled to Santiago the next day uh, on a new aircraft. This aircraft went back to Santiago on a ferry flight a few days later, where they presumably pulled the FDR. Uh, hopefully somebody flipped the breaker to the CDR as well. Right now, the theory, as of the time of this writing, is that it was related to, if you'll believe this, the electric sliding chairs on the flight deck. Now, the electric chairs on the flight deck can slide backwards and forwards for pilot comfort and so that they can get a consistent view of the runway through the HUD. And it sounds like maybe a member of the cabin crew possibly might have activated it by accident, pushing the pilot forward far enough to press him against the yoke and disabling the autopilot. The sliding mechanism involved here is really primarily designed to move the seat out of the way so the pilot can get into and out of it. So it moves on an L-shaped track for that reason. But again, this wouldn't have gone around the L. This would have, we're talking about pushing the pilot forward. It also shouldn't be possible to accidentally lean on the switch and activate it this way. But if there's, there's supposed to be a cover over the switch. But if the cover is loose, then you can do that. And there, Boeing had apparently put out some kind of bulletin about this in the past. But... Yeah, this doesn't seem to have been, um, you know, the kinds of scary things that people were thinking it was going to be. And the 787's digital flight data recorder actually records crew seat control actuations. So I guess we'll find out as soon as the NTSB reads that out. Or the um, New Zealand be, yeah, be the TAC New Zealand. or whatever they are. Yeah, yeah or the uh, would, it, would it not be the NTSB because Boeing? I mean, they might be involved. Yeah, they'll be asked for it. But, yeah, but New Zealand is leading it. Yeah. 
I, I think the 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 position of the seat actuators is a wild thing for flight data recorders to to note down, right? Especially since within our lifetimes, um, there have been well, maybe not Kira, but within our lifetimes, there have been aircraft that recorded, you know, fifteen or twenty parameters at once. Oh, way less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like six. It not only records that. I was actually looking this up. It actually records the position of the cockpit air conditioning controls. I, I, I at this point, I think it it just records anything that happened to exist on whatever field bus wiring was passing that rack. Honestly, so basically, the reason that the autopilot could cause an incident like this is if the aircraft was out of trim uh, at the time of the upset for whatever reason. Disabling the autopilot with a small nose down motion could cause an extremely violent upset as the aircraft tries to force itself back into trim. Um, this may have been why the pitch down was so violent. It hasn't been confirmed yet. Now, before we start our main story, Jay has more interesting facts about CPIT's favorite dumpy little plane, the BAC 111, and we will absolutely force you to hear them because they're very cool. Next slide. They're very cool. All right, next slide. So ever since episode two, the three of us have been ironically obsessed with the BAC-111. So in at least some of these episodes, we're going to subject you to this thing we're calling Jay's BAC-111 Corner, where I tell you the latest bizarre shit that we've learned about what we have unfairly decided is the worst and therefore funniest passenger jet ever made. So I was making some merch, and there will be a link to that in the doobly-doo, and found a scanned brochure for airlines advertising the 111, and I discovered something absolutely incredible about the 111. Now, just to set the scene, at the time the BAC 111 was being designed, BAC was also designing Concorde. They fully expected the future of long haul to be supersonic. Everyone did. You know, Boeing and Lockheed were making their supersonic transports at that time. They didn't cancel it until a bit later. And so the thinking was that subsonic airliners would be limited to these very short segments feeding supersonic routes and therefore require extremely rapid turnarounds and landing on local airports with very few facilities. Because there's no point getting on a Concorde if it takes you two hours to get through the airport at each end. They wanted to land this thing on airfields with absolutely no facilities. Like, literally just a bus stop. Pick up people on a 10-minute turn and then fly 30 minutes to the big airport with the SSTs. So they decided that it should be capable of an absolutely enormous number of pressurization cycles. Every single flight article would be tested to 100,000 cycles and it must have zero fatigue cracking. The landing gear was tested for 240,000 cycles. And of course, with these very short sectors, they needed to mitigate crew fatigue because they would be doing 20, 30 sectors a day. So they made it so that it was capable of maintaining sea level pressurization to 18,000 feet with no loss of fatigue life. How did they do this? Next slide, please. And listeners, I should clarify. 100,000 cycles and 240,000 cycles for the landing gear, these are 10 times what, a, what a, a traditional subsonic aircraft is going to be certified to. That is an obscene level of overbuilding. 100,000 is not 10 times. They um, No, it's about three times. But what it is, is, is it's more than, um, it's, it's probably about three times more than the average plane is going to see in its life. And I don't know. Um, you know, like the extremely high time Aloha Airlines planes, if you ever read my article on Aloha 243, they were pushing into the 90,000 cycle range and they were the highest, you know, highest cycle short haul, you know, planes like this. So there was, there was no, there was very little, this is, is well, it's just a very large number of cycles. We will anyway. get to Aloha. Yeah, we will. So One day. how did they do this? As you can see. The fucking plane was mostly made of sculpture milled parts made using absolutely enormous billets of 6160 alloy, which was then milled to shape and heat treated. There is one 
total one other transport category aircraft that was made that way. And yes, it was Concorde. Of course, it was always going to be Concorde. This is, we realise, how come it got flown at 200 miles per hour into a freeway overpass and only 21 people died. This is how come one particular 111 got bombed by hijackers twice, repaired twice, after landing safely twice, they just replaced that piece and it flew for another, I don't know how many decades. Was it, was it like two decades? I think so, yeah. And it was... Yeah. In both cases, the bomber managed to kill himself only. Yeah. Every time we look at this plane more closely, we find something just utterly unexpected. Next slide, please. So for context listeners, I teased that in the Discord that the 111 was distantly ancestral to one of the vehicles we talked about in the bonus episodes. And I said that you guys weren't going to believe which. And that's because it's the ULA Vulcan rocket that we talked about. This rocket, as well as a handful of others, use the exact same technique, lithium aluminium alloys, to build the, the walls of the fuel tanks. And here's another fact. One of the US airlines to operate the 111 was Aloha, which also had a bunch of 737s. They flew 20 sectors a day on these 111s when they tried to treat the 737 the same way that they had successfully operated the 111, it burst open. Told you we'd get to Aloha. Yeah, we did. It started out as irony, but I think I genuinely love this weird little plane. All right. Next slide. Okay, let's get to the noticed all podcaster section. In the comments for our last episode... Uh, the author of Understanding Air France 447, which we all read uh, for research, uh, hopped into the comments to clarify some things. We've pinned his comment to the top of that video because he goes into quite a bit, um, but I'm going to have Jay quote the top section, which was about G pullout. The actual issue here is not exceeding the structural G limits on the airplane, though at lower altitude that will be a factor but the stall buffet margin is also expressed in G units. At cruise altitude and airspeed, a margin of 1.3 Gs is all it takes to get to the stall buffet. We call this the buffet margin. At low altitude, the issue on the pullout is maximum structural G load, which is 2.5 Gs, but at higher Mach numbers, the stall will occur again at a lower G load than that. He also goes into CRM, um, he goes into a little bit into what Captain du why Captain Dubois had this sort of baffling reaction he did when entering the cockpit. So yeah, go check it out. Um, uh, okay, our Patreon. We have a Patreon if you want to support the show and support Admiral Klogberg's work. We dropped our first bonus episode a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we called it Oops All News. We discussed the recent Boeing issues. We talked about some helicopter crashes, uh, a lot of aviation business updates. Uh, next, we're going to be recording a movie review and recap for the 2022 Russian film The One about the survival of Larisa Savitska. Larisa Savitsky, that one, uh, after a midair collision. Um, this will be exclusive to patrons at our $5 and up JTO bottle user level. And even at our entry level, you still get access to our Discord where we hang out, shitpost, uh, we talk about airplanes, space planes, pets. Uh, we are a little weird. If you like the vibe of these episodes, join the Discord. This show is pretty much just a recorded and polished extension of that. So patreon.com slash cpit, patreon.com slash cpit. Next slide. We also, as always, want to give a special shout out to our contributors at the $15 airframe warranty voider and a $25 fire tetrahedron level. Thank you, Anslam, Fred with a PH, and six anonymous donors for their contribution. Next slide. Okay, so what is today's episode even about? We're here to talk about Guinea. Next slide. No, that's a five guinea coin. Next slide. Mm, pretty sure that's a guinea pig. Next slide. That's Equatorial Guinea. We're getting closer. Next slide. That's Papua New Guinea. We're further away, technically. Next slide. Ah, there it is. Just regular guinea. Original recipe. 
Next slide. All right, let's do a very brief primer on West African aviation. So the first thing you need to know about West African aviation is that it is complicated. Um, one disclaimer I will give is that this area of the world is extremely complicated. There is a lot of history. We are not historians. We are not sociologists of this particular area. We are not experts on it. Um, so this, we're, we're going to touch on uh, only what is sort of directly relevant to this accident. Um, a lot of aviation in West Africa falls into what is known as a gray market. In short, it's not a full Wild West free-for-all, but it's also not the tightly regulated and safe market of Europe, East Asia, and North America. Infrastructure could be woeful. Um, for a long time, there was a severe lack of intra-African flights. Passengers wanted to travel between different countries in the region would sometimes have to connect in Europe, adding multi-hour or even multi-day delays in relatively short, great circle distances. Necessity being the mother of market innovation, so up sprang Air Afrique. This was a joint venture between the governments of Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, Mauritania, Niger, the Republic of the Congo, and Senegal. They had flights between all of these countries as well as neighboring countries providing a sort of vital service. Um, by the 90s, the difficulties of operating that market, though, had left this airline pretty badly saddled by debt. Um, and then, of course, it was killed by the same thing that killed Robert Pattinson in that one movie, and also my generation so for retirement, 9-11. But of course, just doing a 9-11 on an airline doesn't eliminate the market, however affected that market may have been by KSM and bin Laden. But you cannot just go back to the status quo of connecting everyone in Paris, because the lounges of De Gaulle are so disappointing as to be tantamount to treason. How can you have not have champagne out at 8 a.m.? What are you doing? That is illegal or it should be. Anyway, you want to go direct. So into this void steps the criminal empire known henceforth as Union de Transport Africain de Guinée. And if you've never heard of them, don't worry about it. Their Wikipedia page probably hasn't either. It's about as long as a Jeopardy clue and about as difficult to get anything sensible out of. All right, next slide. So, what is a UTA? As we said, they are technically U-T-A-D-G-E, but that's absurd. So we're just going to say U-T-A because that's what it says on the side of the planes. Yeah, which is, that's as far as I can tell, that's the abbreviation the company actually used, not to be confused with UTA, the defunct French airline. Did they do that so that they could just buy the planes and not have to repaint them? No, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think French UTA ever operated the Antonov AM24, so it's on screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, f fine. So, so this airline, um, and from now on, the rest of this this episode, anytime you hear any of us say the word airline, just imagine that we're doing the Joey finger quotes from Friends. Um, they were a razor's edge charter operation based out of Sierra Leone that flew an, an old Soviet turboprop AN24 and a Lat 410. It had been around since 1996, using the Antonov for passenger services and the Lat as an air ambulance and a charter for mining companies. The LET-410 and the AN-224 are the Jesse and James of Sub-Saharan African aviation. Yeah, scrappy African airlines love the L-410 because you can do no maintenance for a decade, then run it through a blender and it will still fly. And the AN-24 can be fixed by someone who can't read and who only has a brick. This is not a joke. Antonov actually designed their early aircraft to be so mechanically simple that you didn't actually need any documentation to repair it. You didn't need to be able to read. Uh, a peasant could fix it. So we should also point out that the owners of this airline weren't from West Africa. They were Lebanese. And more on that in a minute. Around the same time, Middle East Airlines, the flag carrier of Lebanon, Announced, announced a pullout of the West African market. So the Lebanese owners of UTA, thinking that their ticket to fortune was in cornering this extremely specific market, decide to expand their business. Now, it's worth taking a moment to note that these guys being from Lebanon isn't incidental. The Lebanese diaspora, as a group, seized upon the, the tumultuous post-colonization markets in West Africa in the second half of the 20th century. They often acted as go-betweens 
that would help cartoonishly corrupt governments exercise the barest appearance of public works projects. They would also oddly act as agents of stability when one regime was replaced by the next, because it would just be the same Lebanese guys who were doing their graft. So during these nations' attempts to establish functioning democracies in the wake of brutality of Western colonization and then the inevitable collapse of same, there would just be these Lebanese diaspora people who would you know, step in and sort of grease the wheels of a collapsed economy. The Lebanese involvement in West Africa was actually significant enough to get the attention of the CIA in the 80s. Um, post at that one. So as we said, we have a market that needs cornering. We've got some real winners that are going to be doing that cornering. The brilliant individuals that will make up part of our story are Darwish Hazem, the head of UTA, Ahmed Hazem, UTA general manager, and Mohammed Kazem, UTA director of operations. Hmm, I'm detecting that these guys sound like they might be related. <laughs> and you'd be correct. So Ahmed is the father, Darwish and Mohammed are his sons, but Darwish seems to be the driving force behind things here. So we've got Pinky and Pinky in the brain. Yeah, so some other members of the Kazem family are also involved in this operation, but these three are the main ones. Also, none of them have any aviation experience whatsoever, posted that back. So these guys decide that they're going to corner this very specific market and then serve it ruthlessly, which is Guinea to Benin and then onward to Lebanon. Specifically, from Conakry, which is the capital of Guinea, to Cotonou, the largest city in Benin, and then onward to, De to Beirut. Their final leg from Beirut to, to Dubai was tacked on later. Their plan was to to do this route each direction once a week. Simple enough. And for these purposes, they apply to the Guinean Ministry of Transport. They receive a permission to operate in that country. The minister basically signs a blank piece of paper. Uh, away they go. In Guinea, at that time, there was no requirement for them to have a specific air operator certificate or AOC uh, in that country. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about Guinea. Guinea, around, especially around the time of this, uh, accident was kind of a mess. Um, if you think this is sort of a standard colonization result, you'd be right. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. And in this case, we can blame the French, which we love to do on this show. France colonized Guinea. Uh, but by 1958, domestic Guinean politics had become radicalized enough that they were ready to vote for immediate and total independence. Um, so the French uh, graciously accepted the change of power and left with grace uh, and humility. Nope, I'm just kidding. They were lay assholes about it. This was a, an absolutely brutal storm out the door. The French wrecked everything uh, on their way out in 1958. No, seriously, everything. France stopped all financial assistance, withdrew support for the country's economic infrastructure, which led to a severe economic crisis on account of the French having built most of the economy to be totally dependent on France. They dismantled administrative, education, health infrastructure, and removed or destroyed essential tools and documents that were necessary for governance. Property that belonged to the state of Guinea was confiscated or destroyed, including office equipment and vehicles, crippling the new government's operational capacity. And they did this because they absolutely could not tolerate the other countries in the region moving for independence. Yeah. This is this is a punitive deterrent measure. I mean, and when again, they took everything. They unscrewed light bulbs out of the ceilings of buildings and took them with them. It was it was insane. They took the ice cube trays out of the freezer. What kind of sick bitch takes the ice cube trays out of the freezer? And it worked too. Réunion and Guiana are still parts of France. They're still departments of metropolitan France administratively, and they will most likely never escape. Yeah, and we're, we're not even going to touch on uh, Gabon or Niger and their sort of uh, incredibly tight connection with France and their nuclear industry. Again, all of that is kind of outside the scope of this, of this podcast. Um, but what this means is that Guinea had essentially none of what you might describe as state capacity. The means of governance did not exist. Um, they would have to be rebuilt from scratch. But the strongmen who came to power after the French departure did not have any interest in doing this. Overseeing the aviation industry was very far down the list of priorities. They had better things to do, like running water and teach people to read. 
No, really, though, they were barely doing those things either. I mean, the leadership of Guinea was just spectacularly disinterested for a long time. Yeah, most of what these guys were doing for a while was collecting bribes. Uh, the most recent military coup in Guinea with suspension of their constitution was 2021. Yeah, the cycle continued. Okay, next slide. All right, so we've learned about West African aviation. We've learned what UTA wants to do there. Now let's fly to the scene of the crash. Next slide. Okay, if you want to have an airline, the kind of airline that you can run out of a cantina, at minimum, what do you need? I mean, really minimum. The answer is you need a plane and you need some pilots. Boom, you have an airline. Yes. And what kind of plane can you get for real cheap in 2003 that will allow you to fly from Conakry, Cotonou, to Beirut with enough passengers to be profitable? Boeing 727. They went with the Boeing 727, the best plane to be a trans femme gay that does crimes like jumping out of a plane with $200,000. Except that they disabled that feature after that exact thing happened. Hey, the 111 has a ventral door. Do you think it opens in flight? Hmm. We need to get a bunch of cash and find out. <laughs> so, if you are a bunch of random guys who own an ancient Soviet turboprop that you want a 727 in 2003, two decades after they stopped making them, where do you get one? The answer, apparently, is that you ring up this company called the Financial Advisory Group, or, um, uh, unfortunately, FAG. Do we spell out the name every time we mention them, or do we just call them the slur group? I think we'll just, let's just, F F A G, right? We'll just, yeah. F-A-G, we'll just sure. That. Yeah, okay. So F-A-G is one of those shady underworld companies that you you never really know what they're up to. Um, their main business seems to be buying shit heap airplanes, employing down and out pilots, and wet leasing both to obscure cash-strapped airlines in developing countries, um, at least on the surface. We'll have more to say about these guys later. The owner of FAG is one Imad Saba. Um, this is a truly shady figure. Um, again, more about him later. I will say during the research of this, we fell down some rabbit holes. We found out some real wild things. Um, allegedly, he is from Palestine. He holds a U.S. passport. Uh, he lives in the UAE, though he used to reside in Miami. He owns quite a few companies, of which FAG was only one of them. Uh, at some point in the past, FAG was based in Miami but it was later apparently registered in the Virgin Islands. But the only way to contact it was through their, their office in Sharjah in the UAE, um, where Imad Saba was running around in what I can only imagine was a black Mercedes with heavily tinted windows. Anytime particularly stupid corruption comes up, the Florida man is always lurking nearby, isn't he? So Darwish rings up Imad Saba. And Saba offers him a 727 that would end up being registered in Guinea as 3X-ray Golf Delta Mike. A flight crew paid by FAG is also provided. This plane is a heap of shit. Nothing on it works. Uh, the lease begins June 13th, 2003. They run it once from Conakry to Cotonou to Beirut, at which point the Lebanese air safety inspectors flag the plane as suspicious, demand to inspect the aircraft and all of its documentation. And this is early 2000s economy in absolute shambles, Beirut. The plane is that bad that even they throw a flag on the field. Yeah, the Lebanese authorities conclude that the plane is in such a bad shape, it's unsafe to, pa to carry passengers or cargo. They bar it from flying completely. In fact, they agree to let this thing leave Lebanon only on the condition that it be flown directly to a boneyard. So FAG takes the plane back, flies it to Sharjah, and it's never seen again. UTA still has the route. They don't have a Boeing 720, 727 anymore. Undeterred by this, they ask FAG for another one. And Iman Saba provides. Next slide. Let's talk about 3X-ray Golf Delta Oscar, a.k.a. Boeing serial number 21370. This airplane was delivered new to American Airlines in, 1990s, in 1977, who ran it ragged until 2001. Then, this thing gets what it probably imagined was going to be a dignified retirement at the Bone Yard in the Mojave Desert, but nope. Wells Fargo Bank Northwest buys it from us the scrapyard in February of 2002, after which they sell it to our man Imad Saba of the Financial Advisory Group. FAG then turns around and leases the plane to Ariana Afghan Airlines, the flag carrier of Afghanistan, in January of 2003. It is registered in Afghanistan as Yankee Alpha Foxtrot Alpha Kilo. Yeah, fuck. 
<laughs> Fact. Which is honestly the only sane reaction to this plane. So, on account of it being Afghanistan circa 2003, doesn't go great. So the plane doesn't stay in Afghanistan very long. But for some reason, Ariana does swap out the engines without documenting the change whatsoever. Do we even know where they found these engines? I mean, they're JT-8Ds. In 2003, you could probably find one in a dumpster behind a KFC or something. Oh my god, yeah. I mean, honestly, these are these engines are, are a dime a dozen. Um, if you, especially if you are willing to buy one that's been houred out um, and not care that it is illegal to fly it. I tried to find one actually on eBay um, just for the slide, but uh, I there was there wasn't one on eBay. But they have been, they absolutely have been on eBay in the past. Uh, in the in the recent past, they pop up every now and then. Yeah, I I believe they still make spares for them. So you know, I know a lot of people um, run them on seven thirty seven classics that have gravel kits. Um, and God, we're going to talk about those one day because God, these planes are so cool. Um, as well as um, any of the flying MD-80s. And I think they still use them a lot of as like as marine turbines or power generation. But sorry, that's a separate issue. So by June of 2003, this thing is out of Central Asia, has been re-registered and leased by FAG to a Swaziland airline ostensibly called Alpha Omega Airways, where it's re-registered as three Delta Fox Red Alpha Kilo. Alpha Omega then subleases the plane to UTA in theory, sort of, brackets, question mark. So Alpha Omega presents itself uh, to the bank as the, and to UTA as the owner, which it isn't. But Imad Saba of FAG is the one who actually signs the paperwork. The contract was for 30 days, after which UTA would sign a new contract directly with FAG that re-registers the, the plane in Guinea as 3X-Ray Golf Delta Oscar. The contract stated that FAG would supply the airplane in good condition with a flight crew. UTA would carry out the maintenance, update flight records and maintenance documents in accordance with regulations, and pay crews and all other operating costs. However, UTA didn't have any maintenance facilities, so it's not clear who was actually doing this, the maintenance on this plane, uh, if anyone. They were not shipping this thing up to Frankfurt to go to Lufthansa Technik. Some people within UTA later claimed that the plane was meant to be sent to Ariana Afghan Airlines for heavier maintenance, um, also, FAG apparently had a maintenance facility whose location was never discovered or disclosed. Imagine how bad you are scraping the bottom of the barrel if you are sending your plane to Afghanistan for a sea check. Seriously. <laughs> UTA being responsible for documentation is real rich. Another post-it. In July of 2003, the plane arrives in Beirut, and again, the inspectors make a bunch of observations. So we took a look at this. The minimum equipment list is from American Airlines. The operating certificate belongs to Alpha Omega Airways. The checklists are from Ariana Afghan Airlines, and the insurance papers are for a completely different plane entirely. It also has no ownership or leasing documentation. Basically, they asked for license insurance and proof of ownership, and they got one Uno card, a bunch of McDonald's straw wrappers, and a receipt for a box of tampons. Those two items would constitute more documentation than this aircraft had at this point in time. They also find Lebanese authorities cite the following. Torch in cockpit, inoperative. Flight recorder emergency pingers, inoperative. Which is, to be fair, completely irrelevant because we know exactly where the plane crashed. Extinguisher bottles and engines number one and number three were never tested. The illuminated exit path was inoperative in economy. Passenger instruction signs were inoperative. They were missing emergency equipment signs. The backup compass had not been calibrated since January of 1997. They did not have an emergency locator beacon. The tire on number th on wheel number three was beyond the wear limits. The tire on number four was in bad condition. The VHF antenna was cracked. And engine number two had an oil leak. Now, none of these are showstoppers. These are all relatively minor fixes. But we are painting a picture for you of a plane that is falling apart. So UTA is the bare minimum to fix these things. A few days later, the plane carries on its merry way. I should point out that um, these are all things that a ramp inspector can do, can, like, can check on a foreign airplane. They can't check things like, is the plane structurally sound? 
So we don't actually know what the worst issues with this plane were, and we aren't going to find out because it fucking crashed. Anyway. To be fair, the fire extinguisher bottles were kind of irrelevant given that it ended up in the ocean. So, you know, there's that. True. <laughs> yeah. And they also turned out not to need the indication for the where the emergency exit was because they could. there was just big fucking holes in the fuselage. But again, we'll get to that. So somehow this works. All of All of this somehow works for a few weeks. These guys are running the absolute ragged edge of possibility, um, but they are doing it. They are running uh, Kona Cree to Cotonou to Beirut and then on to Dubai because sure, fuck it, why not? Apparently this was uh, for duty-free shopping, allegedly, and I'm sure the Emirates aren't going to turn down a pipeline for <clears throat> labor. Also, I bet the owners had business there. I mean, Ivan Sava might even have insisted on it. Yeah, and these guys are doing these flights every week because the UTA doesn't care about running the crew ragged either. Oh, you heard us correctly. The crew. FAG only provides UTA with one crew at a time. They choose the first two crews. Uh, we're not sure why, but we pick up the story with a third crew. Again, this is one crew that is doing all of the UTA's 727 flights. We don't really know why the first two crews left, but it was probably related to a bunch of criminals running them to exhaustion. <laughs> we do know that these guys are regularly blasting right through duty time limits, and we'll get into how we know this later on. So now you have a situation where the continued existence of the airline is reliant on these three pilots never missing a beat and never missing a day of work. That means these guys are constantly under crazy pressure. Now, the skill of the pilots is not a concern. It's not relevant to this accident. They all have plenty of experience. We're led by the fearless Captain Najib Albaruni, age 49, 11,000 total flying hours, 8,000 of which were on the 727. He's apparently of Libyan origin, used to fly for Libyan Arab Airlines. The first officer was also 49 years old with an unknown number of flight hours. He also used to fly for Libyan Arab Airlines, and his name was possibly Ahmed al Humaidi. And the flight engineer was a 45-year-old male who had 14,000 flight hours all on the Boeing 727. One source we found says he was originally from Peru and his name was Jose Rios Madueño, but we can't actually confirm that information fully. They also fly with the same four cabin crew on every flight, plus two mechanics and a transporter of some kind, um, which I'm sort of interpreting as a local fixer that would be on hand for bribes and dealing with like red tape customs issues, usually with bribes. Yeah, more organizational chaos. There was no written contract between UTA and the cabin crew. They were just kind of there. No paperwork, only vibes. That that will become a theme. All right, next slide. So every week, these guys fly the route, Conakry, Contenu, uh, to Kufa Airport in Libya, which is way in the middle of the goddamn desert for gas, um, and then on to Beirut, and then the last leg to Dubai. Then it turn around, and it goes back. Uh, when it stops in Beirut, the Lebanese would always demand that things get fixed. UTA would do whatever the absolute minimum was to get it past inspections and get it going again. Um, by the way, this was obviously the only work that was ever done while UTA was in possession of the aircraft. Yeah, after the fact, literally no one could point to any maintenance that had been done since UTA acquired the airplane other than the work done in Lebanon in order to get approval to leave. What you have to know about this operation, if you have it together, is that it was fucked from the jump. Can this plane, as configured, sustainably do this route without falling apart? Who knows? Uh, that's, that's, that's not a joke. Um, literally, no one knew, but probably not. Um, they hired a company called Gatwick Aviation to do a route feasibility study. Um, that takes numerous factors into account, sort of an actuarial document. Um, by the way, do you know where this company is based? Nope, you're wrong. It's Dubai. Is it named after some dude named Gatwick then? Like Bob Gatwick? The Emirates are the Florida of the Middle East, and Dubai is the most Florida. Some sketchy bullshit going on in a Gulf state? It's always fucking Dubai. Uh, I think Doha would be Zurich. Um, all right, let me, let me turn on this. Okay, I think Dubai would be Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Abu Dhabi would be Tampa, and Sharjah would be Jacksonville. That sounds about right. Which I guess... Yeah, I think that would make Iman that would make Iman Saba Jason Mendoza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of this matters anyway because no documentation supporting this was ever provided. Investigators later asked for the alleged route feasibility study, 
conducted by Gatwick Aviation, and everyone was just like, shrug, I, didn't, I don't know. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that anyone planned anything, to be honest. Yeah, I think they drew a line on a map with rulers on a map and went, eh, close enough. So, was anyone going to be putting a stop to this? Turns out that in practice, that's kind of hard. Yeah, Guinea was a member of the International Civil Aviation Organization, but both Lebanon and Benin did not have the capability to determine whether Guinea was actually enforcing its own regulations, which they weren't. And Guinea obviously couldn't do it because their governmental aviation bureaucracy was basically non-existent, having been completely destroyed by the French. Next slide. Okay, so we've had a good background on all the important pieces. We have a flying scrap heap blown by exhausted pilots with little to no paperwork in a totally unregulated environment. Let's find out how it goes wrong. The date is December 25th, 2003. So our plane leaves Conakry and arrives in Cotonou without much trouble. And so there are two UTA company executives on board, believe it or not, which I guess is really standing behind your product. Um, specifically, Darwish Kazem himself is on the plane. He's heading home to Beirut. Um, and I just want to say he and his family clearly used this airline as like their own private taxi service because the plane literally had six seats reserved for UTA management, which I presume is the Kazem family because almost all the management positions were held by members of said family. Um, anyway, the events of our story start to totally unravel as soon as they begin boarding at Cotonou. So for starters, UTA has dozens of people that are trying to get to Lebanon for Christmas, way more than they can actually fit on this plane. Um, and many of these people that want to go to Lebanon are in fact not booked on the flight. <clears throat> but it turns out it was possible for passengers to sell their boarding cards to other passengers after checking in because they didn't have names on them and no one was marking them off. Now I'm guessing the way this worked was you check in, you get a boarding card, you use the boarding card to get into a secure area that's probably in the same room, just roped off. Then you use the you sell the, your used boarding card back across the rope, and then anyone in the secure area gets let on the plane with no further checks. That's my assumption. So the gate agents are just boarding this plane based on vibes? Is, yeah. is that it? Yeah. Now, at the same time, the throwers, yes, that's what they're actually called, um, are loading the bags into the plane. Now, on your typical flight on, say, Cathay Pacific, uh, the throwers are going to load the plane in a very specific order, which eat, which with each bag's weight, size, and destinations all taken into account. This is then turned into a weight balance sheet, which is an actual sheet of paper. Um, when your pilot has told you that they're waiting on paperwork, a lot of the time, this particular piece of paper is the one they're waiting on. This does not happen. Yeah, not only is there no record of the weight and placement of the bags, they didn't weigh the bags at all. Um, these guys were also just putting bags wherever. Um, most And most importantly, they're putting way too many of them into the forward baggage compartment, which makes the plane very nose heavy. Now, this isn't actually a crisis because a nose heavy plane flies poorly while a tail heavy plane flies only once. <laughs> and in this case, a nose heavy plane also only flies once, but we'll get to that. Oh, yeah. And remember how it's Christmas Day? Well, a lot of the passengers are bringing their Christmas presents with them to buy route, so the sort of mm, average bag weight that the weight and balance sheets use is going to be even more useless. So now we have some number of bags in some order that weigh some amount. Yeah. And now we know that the mass of the baggage was a mystery, but surely the number of people isn't, because planes keep detailed manifests of the number of souls on board, right? LOL. L-M-A-O, even. Yeah, there's no conclusive answer to how many people were on board this plane. But here's what we do know. This 727 had 140 passenger seats, plus four flight attendant jump seats, two cockpit jump seats, and six extra seats for airline personnel. So every one of these was filled. They sat both of the airline executives in the co two cockpit jump seats. Again, one of those is Darwish. Gave them an excellent view of what was about to happen, by the way. As for the main cabin, we know that 86 passengers boarded in Conakry and nine of those got off in Cotonou. The manifest that the pilots were given said that 73 new passengers boarded in Cotonou, which would take the total to 150. Um, among those passengers, by the way, are 15 army officers from Bangladesh returning from UN peacekeeping duty in West Africa. 
but um, most of the passengers, over 100 of them, in fact, were Lebanese. So there were only 146 passenger seats, including the airline personnel seats, three of which would have been occupied by the mechanics and the transporter. However, there were six lap children, so the 150 passengers would have taken up 144 seats, which comes out to one more than was actually available. However, the actual number of passengers was definitely more than 150, and we know this for reasons we'll get into after the accident. So, but the real number will never be known, but it could have been up to 160 passengers in addition to the 10 crew members, which means that there may have been as many as a dozen people without seatbelts or proper seating. And as a result, the boarding was chaos. No one had a seat assignment. Some people didn't even have tickets. People were jockeying for whatever seats they could get. The cabin crew was doing everything they can to keep the situation under some kind of control. So it's just like Southwest then is what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's Southwest. <laughs> yeah. Um, next slide, please. So after the crash, investigators crunched the numbers. And after factoring known quantities, including fuel and their best guesses for people in bags, their estimation of um, this, this flight, Flight 141's takeoff weight falls somewhere between 179 and 190,000 pounds. And this is, well, still below the 727's max takeoff weight of 209,000 pounds. However, it's above the max takeoff weight for the runway in Cotonou, which was only 2,400 meters long, with an outside temperature of 32 degrees C, which reduces performance. So they have a short runway, high temperature, that both means less performance, lower max takeoff weight. So for those conditions, and with flaps 25, the max takeoff weight was only 172,000 pounds, which was definitely less than what they were. Now the flight crew is not oblivious to this, since they're watching the boarding and loading process from the flight deck. And in fact, about 30 minutes before takeoff, the cockpit voice recording starts. And the first thing we hear is the first officer, al uh, Humaydi, say... Jay. The sheets they gave us don't have the load. What is that? Come on, come on. The sheets they gave us don't have the weight, only the number of passengers. And the captain says, Ari. Don't worry, we have the passenger manifest just without weight. Which, I mean, great, but that's like only knowing the pressure in two of your car tires. It's very much only half the information you need. You can't just infer the other half. So anyway, Darwish Hazem is in the cockpit listening to all of this. So the first officer says, Jay. Each of them is bringing on board the airplane a 200 kilo suitcase. 200 kilos. That's not possible. Get them to unload them and weigh them. And then we'll know. If we manage to take off, the people, I, I tell you, it will be quite a performance if we manage to take off today. At least let them put the exact weight so that we know it. Let them put the exact weight so that we can calculate it. But Darwish just says, quote, but the weight is indicated here, to which the first officer says, There is no weight. Each passenger came on board with a 20 kilo bag. It's impossible. If you have an airplane with 100 passengers, if this airplane takes off today, you will see if this airplane takes off. Otherwise, we're going to drop into the sea. You have 141. You will see when the aircraft will take off or we will crash into the sea. So Darwish does the classic middle manager thing and he deflects upwards. He says, quote, I'm sorry, as soon as we arrive in Beirut, I'm going to tell him off. What can I do? What can I do? And on the return, I cannot do anything. I came, I made this problem, I cannot return. So the FO tries to reason and compromise and he says, No, don't, don't send the passengers back, but the baggage must stay here, meaning in Cotonou. So Darwish, the ever-courageous lion, says, I will send six messages that more 30-kilo hand luggage and hand baggage is not allowed. For whatever that's good that's going to do. So anyway, the pilots know that this isn't right. I mean, these numbers, the numbers are being given are a joke. They're dangerously overloaded. But there's no way for them to override this situation because what are they going to do? Stop and face down hundreds of angry travelers who are going to miss Christmas? The crew has no higher authority to appeal to for support. While the captain has the ultimate authority on paper and can, in fact, refuse to fly on intuition, he can't because he's sitting three feet away from the director of the company. There's no way he's actually going to do that. Like, you know, in, you know, if a pilot for American Airlines can refuse a plane and he will know that the, there's a management structure there that's going to back him up and, you know, say, you know, prevent there from being consequences for this. 
this guy has nothing. So he proceeds with the pre-flight. So now we've got a flight crew who has no idea how many people are behind them. They have no idea how many bags there are. They have no idea how heavy they are or where the, the bags are. And now they need to decide how to configure the airplane for takeoff. <laughs> So the most two most important elements of this configuration are the V speeds and the stab trim setting. So V speeds are the various speeds that are called out during takeoff, like V1, VR, which is rotation speed, and so on. And the stab trim setting refers to the position of the horizontal stabilizer on the tail, which determines the plane's resting pitch angle. So in flight, the stabilizer pushes the tail down, pivoting the airplane about its center of lift to raise the nose. You can picture it like a lever in this diagram. So how many units of stabilizer trim you apply determines how powerful this downforce on the tail is going to be. So it's vital to set this trim correctly, and in order for it to be set correctly, you need to know exactly how much weight you have and where for each of your three variables, gas, humans, and bags. And these guys only have one of the three, which is gas, because that's in the same place every time. <laughs> now, I should note that while the absolute amount of weight is important for staff trim setting purposes, its distribution is way more important. Next slide, please. So before we talk about the settings they chose, I have to explain a little bit about center of gravity, center of lift, and mean aerodynamic cord. So center of gravity is pretty self-explanatory. It's the specific point where you could balance the entire weight of the plane. If you're inside the plane, there's usually like an arrow. Um, it's almost always the same window you'd look out of to look at the engine. The CG is measured in terms of its position along the mean aerodynamic cord. And what that means is imagine you're looking at a swept wing from the top down. Um, as you can see on this slide. A cord, in general, is a line drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge, but the length of any given cord is different depending on how far out on the wing you draw it, because the wing tapers. So the mean aerodynamic cord is basically an average of all of the possible cords down the length of the wing. You can calculate it using an integral if you remember any calculus. And this mean aerodynamic cord, or MAC, tells you roughly where the center of lift is for the wing overall, despite its non-uniform shape. The center of lift, or the center of pressure, is the point where the aerodynamic forces of the aircraft act through. The location of the mean aerodynamic cord is fixed for a given aircraft. All of this complicated math is done by engineers when the plane is designed, you know, um, unless it's the space shuttle, in which case it's happening in real time on four of the five GPCs. And if it goes wrong, then you're definitely going to die. Um, in the last episode, we had a whole slide about planes that crave disintegration via instability. The shuttle was definitely one of them. Um, but the reason that it's so complicated for the shuttle is that it, it has to operate in this vast range of different speeds, whereas our 727 does not. It only really has to operate between zero and like 0.8 mark. So the mean aerodynamic cord and the center of pressure don't really move with respect to each other. You want the center of gravity to be forward of the center of lift which pulls the nose down, and then the stabilizer trim pushes the tail down, and that levers the nose up, counteracting this nose down tendency. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. And you can picture this mean aerodynamic cord as an imaginary line stretching from the leading of edge of the wing to the trailing edge. As shown. As shown. And the center of gravity is supposed to be actually a percentage of the way along that. And of course, the um, flight crew operating manual for the plane, if you have one. Did this plane even have one? I don't think it did, did it? Yeah, I'm not uh, sure it did. Yeah, <laughs> I don't so. Um, yeah, so... The pilots calculate where the center of gravity is, whether it's far enough forwards of the center of lift, using a formula that the manufacturer gives them that allows them to plug in how much baggage and passengers are in each part of the plane. And they get in return 
from this formula the location of the center of gravity relative to the mean aerodynamic chord, which is expressed as a percentage, as I say. What this means is that a center of gravity of 25% MAC is located 25% of the way from the leading edge towards the trailing edge along this imaginary chord line. The crew can then compare this to a, a manufacturer-provided range of acceptable values. There's a table. And then they can use this figure to calculate how much downforce they need from the stab trim to get the nose into the air on takeoff. Basically, the tendency of the plane when it's receiving lift from its wings to nose up or nose down. The farther forwards the CG is, the more stab trim you need. Yeah. So evidence indicates that the flight crew calculated their stabilizer trim position assuming a weight of 172,000 pounds, which was the maximum, and a center of gravity of 19% MAC. But as it turns out, the real figure calculated after the fact was 14%, not 19%, which is way forward of their calculations, because the throwers in Cuffnu just stuffed everything in the forward baggage hold until it was full, and the pilots were unaware of this. Incidentally, you want this number to be as low as possible because the higher it is, the less efficient the plane is. So these guys set the takeoff trim on the stabilizer to 6.75 units nose up, which is the value provided in the manual for a CG of 19%. What they actually needed was 7.75 units. It doesn't sound like much, but that single unit is about to make all the difference in the world. Next slide. Anyway, so these guys finish their pre-flight, they start to taxi, and even this is a mess because there are people in the aisles who can't refuse to sit down or can't sit down. Again, the cabin crews take several minutes to get everyone to calm down and stop yelling and moving around. And uh, Again, I, some of them are apparently just sitting on whatever they can find, presumably. So the pilots know they're going to need every single inch of pavement. They also know they're overweight, despite the fact that they used the um, max takeoff weight, they knew they were over that. So just in case, they select a rotation speed of 137 knots, which corresponds to a weight of 170,000 pounds and not the 172,000 pounds official weight. This would help make sure they don't rotate for liftoff before achieving sufficient speed to become airborne. You know what would have been useful right now? Jato bottles. Yeah, not even that of much of a joke this episode, because that's literally what Jato bottles are for. Short field, hot and heavy takeoffs. Also rad pyro effects, but you know. True. <laughs> so the time now is 13.58 and one second, and our very short accident sequence has begun. Seriously, in the report, the accident sequence is three sentences long. Yeah. So they start their takeoff and they roll and roll. The report states that even the tower noticed how long this roll was taking. So they hit VR, rotation speed, 137 knots. Um, the captain calls for out, out rotate. So the first officer, who's pilot flying, hauls back on his controls and nothing happens. The captain is heard on the CVR shouting, rotate, rotate, more, 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 pull, pull. But what's happening here is that their stabilizer is not providing enough nose-up force to overcome the forward center of gravity. To get the nose up and become airborne, the pilot now has to apply that force manually instead using the elevators. And this was theoretically possible to do, but it would have required an immediate and extremely aggressive full nose-up input. So realistically, it wasn't going to happen. And this leaves them 300 meters before the run end of the runway. They get airborne just. So the first officer is only barely able to overcome the forward CG and put the plane to the shallowest imaginable climb. Now, normally this wouldn't be catastrophic because the runway at Cotonou points right out to sea. They can just climb slowly. But 118 meters beyond the runway end is a concrete blockhouse containing electronic equipment for the localizer array. And I should note that this doesn't meet obstacle clearance standards by any means. But clear standards didn't exist when this building was constructed sometime in the mid-1960s and it was still there. So, and unfortunately, they have only managed to climb 1.2 meters above the runway level, and the blockhouse is 2.4 meters tall. 1.2 meters and this accident never happens. Or, or, you know, it happens on a different day because, I mean, honestly, let's not kid ourselves here. This is not a safety culture. <laughs> yeah, next slide, please. 
So at 13.59 and 11 seconds, the landing gear and lower fuselage strike the roof of the concrete blockhouse with enough force to tear the roof off, rotate it 45 degrees, and throw it 9 meters. Pictured. Um, this absolutely obliterates the building, and that also tears both of the main landing gears off, and mid-yeet, the right main landing gear takes out the right inboard flaps. Also, a ground worker in the building was struck by debris and was pretty severely injured. This draws a huge amount of energy out of the plane, and because it's lost its right wing flaps in the collision too, it's down a lot of lift, so it just crashes right back to Earth. Clearly this disaster happened because they bought 727s instead of BAC-111s. The BAC-111s would have bounced. It probably would have just smashed right through the building and kept going without noticing. Of course, I don't think it's actually possible to misload the 111 by that much, because it's not really long enough. Well, not for lack of trying by BAC, that's for sure. <laughs> so, the 727 clips a perimeter wall, and then it hits the beach. And once it does, it breaks into three pieces immediately. The tail breaks away, the cockpit snaps the other direction, and the main fuselage continues forward and overturns into the water. So they hit the water with a huge amount of force, and since a lot of the passengers weren't wearing seatbelts, or didn't even have seatbelts, they got thrown everywhere. And rather tragically, the first officer that was trying to talk some sense into Darwish Hazem was mortally wounded and would later die in hospital. Um, everyone else in the cockpit was able to scramble out through the huge hole that was now right behind them, including Darwish. Motherfucker survives. <laughs> and that's actually kind of a theme here. Most of the survivors were people who managed to swim out through holes and breaks in the fuselage. The rest of those that were killed were either killed instantly on impact, or they drowned when they couldn't get out of the plane. The water was shallower than the height of the fuselage, but the fuselage was upside down, which, you know, obviously didn't really help anything. Uh, scuba diving pro tip, if you cannot figure out which way is up, look at bubbles. Um, this is a useful trick for underwater caves. Yeah, so first responders had a lot of trouble getting to the scene, because even though they were notified right after the impact... Um, literally thousands of onlookers got to the crash site before them. Uh, a lot of the survivors um, that made it out of the fuselage were picked up by fishing boats, incidentally. Many of the survivors got to the hospital by the way of locals just picking them up and taking them. Yeah, and it's just as well because there was no way to even know how many people were on the plane or how many ambulances they needed to send, anything like that. Because as we said, there were no manifests, no seat maps. They didn't even know how many ticket sales there were. So in the end, they found 141 bodies and identified 22 survivors, all of whom were injured in some way. And that totals out to 163 people, including 153 passengers and 10 crew, which doesn't match the 143 available passenger seats on board, even after accounting for babies. It doesn't match the 145 passengers heard on the CVR. We didn't quote that, but they mentioned at some point. It also doesn't match the 149 passengers on the semi-improvised manifest and weight and balance sheet. But it gets worse, because 12 of the deceased people that were found couldn't be identified, and 7 people that were listed as missing didn't match the 12 unidentified bodies. Which means that the 7 missing people were probably washed out to sea and never found, and that means that the death toll is indeterminate. It could be anywhere from 141 to 148 if you add the 7 missing to the number of bodies recovered. Wild, I know. Next slide, please. Alright. So let's talk about the aftermath. And boy, this is this is the best part of this episode. Let's... <laughs> For sure. Okay, before we start this section, um, I want to call out a listener, um, Sam from Saudi Arabia. Um, Sam speaks fluent Arabic. Uh, he was a lifesaver in helping us find news stories in Arabic. and was able to translate a lot of stuff for us. Um, so Sam, thank you. You are a huge help. Okay, so the immediate aftermath of this accident was a mess. Um, the identification of bodies was difficult because there was no manifest. Um, they had no idea where to even start with some of the individuals. One of the Arabic news stories we found said that the Guinean and Beninese uh, authorities reached out to the U.S. and to the U.N. to help to seek help with um, with IDing some of the bodies. Yeah, and rather tragically, that um, at least one or two bodies were sent to the wrong place um, because they were misidentified. So some, I think, two Lebanese victims ended up sent to Bangladesh, and they had to send them back. So the first thing Benin does is brings in the French uh, Bureau of Inquiry and Analysis, or BEA, um, which is headquartered out of this charming little French office outside uh, Les Bourges. You will recognize them from our previous episode about Air France. This crash was not connected to France, although arguably they were ultimately responsible. 
But the BEA is one of the most respected accident investigators in the world, and it has the capabilities and resources to make sure an investigation like this is done properly. And of course, it helps that Benin was a French colony until 1959. Okay, but the BEA runs into a brick wall pretty quickly. As for starters, no one wants to talk. No one with the captain is uh, going to willingly give a statement. The captain almost certainly did a willing statement because he wants to clear, wanted to clear his name. They do recover the black boxes two days later, so they start to put the events in order. But the BEA already has the testimony of the captain and the tower controller. So they have a rough idea that its accident was almost certainly caused by the plane being unable to take off. So the first thing they do is they wanted to find the, the aircraft's weight and balance. UT was unable to supply a weight and balance sheet, a copy of which must be kept on the ground before every flight, or any, in fact, information about the plane's weight on the accident flight or any other flight. The airport ground services in Cotonou said that UTA didn't ask them to provide any weight and balance sheets. The representatives from Lebanon did manage to dig up several weight and balance sheets from the times the aircraft landed in Beirut, several of which were printed on uh, Alpha and Omega Airlines paper letterhead, uh, of which three had been filled out during stops in Beirut. Part of one of these sheets was also found in the wreckage. As a hilarious side note, the name of the airplane's previous operator was Alpha Omega Airways, not Airlines. So someone at that company commissioned custom weight and balance sheets, but got the name of their own airline wrong. <laughs> I have to imagine that that this paperwork, sort of like all their paperwork, was was performative, right? It was done to it was designed to be done to such a state that they would hand it to an inspector, you know, with a with cash paper clipped to it. When the inspector could go, "Yep, this looks like a weight and balance sheet." Uh, investigate no further. Yeah, so these sheets sheets are supposed to contain the empty weight of the aircraft, but each different sheet had a different empty weight. <laughs> these figures range from 95,900 to 105,200 pounds, and on the Alpha Omega Airlines sheet, the empty weight was for a different version of the 727 entirely. So on top of this, the passenger and baggage manifests were clearly incomplete or outright false. Hey, you know, air Airplanes can retain water as well, you know. In the end, the BEA was able to reconstruct how much the plane actually weighed by taking the performance data from the flight data recorder and solving for weight as the variable, which resulted in a probable weight of 188,500 pounds, which was well over the maximum for that runway under those conditions, but also assumes that the engines were working properly. They were, actually. As far as, as far as investigators could tell, they were working properly. However, the simulation showed that the plane would have still become airborne at that weight, all else being equal, because obviously, you know, none of these things are a hard and fast limit. There's supposed to be safety margin in those, in those numbers. The simulation showed that the plane could still have become airborne at that weight, the data on the failed rotation showed that the real culprit was that the center of gravity was much further forwards than the pilots thought, as a result of which the stabilizer was not set correctly, which prevented them from bringing the nose up. So now the BEA has a why, pretty conclusively. The BEA knows that a crew with an overloaded bird tried to take off without having any way to know how heavy they were, where that weight was, or how they could take off safely. So we have a why. The how, on the other hand, is fucking wild. Next slide. All right. We have to talk about how UTA, as an entity, is just a crime all the way down. It turns out UTA is more accurately called a crime family. Um, as we said, this was all one family. Now, I should note the report for this accident is scathing. I can't speak for Kira. She's obviously read dozens or hundreds of these reports, but this is the first time I've ever seen a report use the word apparently to cast shade and doubt on its own subject. They use it eight times. They also use an exclamation point to indicate shock, which definitely a first for me. Yeah, it's really almost funny. You can picture the investigators learning some new piece of bizarre information, going, what the hell? And then receiving shrugs from everyone who they asked for an explanation and then noting it down with, apparently. <laughs> hey, hey, I mean, they were French, so it would have probably been, uh, and uh, receiving shrugs is a way of life for, you know, um, Parisians, I'm just going to say. The Hazem's family influence is Lebanon, 
uh, was also murky, probably criminal. The Lebanese defense minister told the press he thought local officials might have exerted pressure uh, to have the UTA air aircraft land there. When BEA started to pull apart the airline's assets, though, is when things got really wild. The airline owned three planes, two shipping containers, and a desk. That's that's literally, that's it. That's not a ship post. The report contained a, a accounting of everything they owned and in a more detailed manifest that was ever provided to one of their flight crews. The headquarters of the airline was inside the building of a Conakry travel agency that also happened to be owned by Darwish Hazem. Shocker. They rented a single check-in desk at Conakry. They had two shipping containers on the grounds of Conakry airports. One of them contained spare parts. The other, I quote, was used to stock the printed paperwork need for inf needed for operations and bottles of mineral water. The two genders. <laughs> Remember, this is a wet lease. They were supposed to provide everything except a crew and depot-level maintenance, which they couldn't afford and wouldn't have done anyway. And the deeper the BEA dug, the worse it got. The chief pilot was also the director of assurance, so there was no supervision. Also, he wasn't rated on the 727. They had no maintenance manuals. They had no inspection manuals. The MELs had only ever been provisionally approved, so due diligence was a pencil whip by Guinea authorities at best. The operations manual referred to departments that did not exist. Specifically, the flight sport manager, the section dispatch manager, the navigation and Carly Rae Jepsen section. Hey, I just cleared you, and this is crazy, but you're below minimums, so go around maybe. Systems, procedures and publication section, and the crew scheduling and records section. This airline also had no flight support manager, navigation support system, operation center, briefing materials, remote support network. Operations manuals talked about destinations that didn't exist. They had flight plans that didn't exist. There was no evidence of a maintenance manual. The operations manual contained no information about air aircraft weights, flight duty time limits, weight and balance limits. The report lists three different serial numbers on each engine because the paperwork and the engines on the plane don't match. And in fact, they don't match in different ways depending on which piece of paperwork you're looking at. And this is because Ariana Afghan Airlines swapped the engines without documenting it. Remember that? This plane with three KFC dumpster engines has no flight history documentation, including hours flown by the flight crew. This had to be ascertained through repeated interviews of flight crew and ground staff. I actually want to read you an excerpt from the report that was so wild I had to post it in the host chat. Quote, UTA was not able to produce the slightest data on the flights that it had performed, flying hours and periods of service of the crew members and airplane maintenance personnel, nor was it able to supply any documents at all relating to the weight and balance calculation for any previous flight. It was incapable of indicating who was, in reality, responsible for supervising the loading of the holds and what such a person's instructions or training might be. Quote, their documentation sp spoke to a fleet management plant for L-1011s, a plane they never flew. They weren't nearly cool enough to have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> they had company documents, which contained chapters in English, not Arabic or French, relating to the operation of L-1011s, 707s, Fokker 50s, DHC-8 Twin Otters, notably none of which are planes that they ever owned, let alone operated. You know why they didn't operate the L-1011? It's because you can't get dumpster RB-211s. True. <laughs> it's true. Documents specify training related to the 727 that was done in 2002, which is impossible because it predates even their intention to buy a 727. Yeah, here's what the BEA had to say about the operations manual overall. Quote, Numerous errors, omissions, and inconsistencies appear on first reading of this document, clearly assembled from clumsy copying from one or more operations manuals from foreign airlines, and obviously only destined to fulfill the regulatory obligation. The wording of some chapters, for example, corresponds to activities based in Jordan or in Gaza. The operations manual did, however, have the following insertion, quote, safety is the most important rule for all airlines. This is an essential ingredient for any evaluation of success. This is the responsibility of all. Our objective is the effective mastery of disaster with zero accidents. <laughs> the mastery of disasters means the prevention of injuries or accidents to persons or goods. 
<laughs> with UTA, safety is the priority. Try to make it your attitude and rule of life. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Next slide. Next slide, please. These, on the other hand, are the masters of disaster who are also criminals. Actually, three of them are from the same family, um, which, you know, has parallels here. History does not record whether the UTA guys ever clashed with Batman. New Wave here, the only supervillain I think who has ever been named Becky, is clearly connected to that shipping container full of mineral water. Uh, also, briefly, the ownership of the company and the plane itself were a mess. Um, the owner was FAG, which is ostensibly a US Virgin Islands company, but was actually just a front for the actual operations in Dubai, but first started in Miami. Which means that, of course, this plane was also struck by the indefatigable Florida man. The report is so confused about the role of FAG in all of this that it just gives up and doesn't even try to map it out. Which is why, next slide, we decided to map some of it out ourselves with help from Sam's sources. And holy fucking shit, it's just a gigantic slimy web of crimes. <laughs> so in 2008, the head of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency claimed in front of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations that the accident airplane was carrying $2 million in cash for Hezbollah, which had been extorted as tribute from Lebanese merchants in West Africa. On the other hand, this is the same DEA that regularly gets caught doing all kinds of scummy things, so I don't know that we can totally trust them to be impartial here. But on the other other hand, do I trust them any less than any of other other sources for this section? Also kind of no. So what we can confirm is that the owner of the airplane and FAG, Iman Saba, was a very shifty dude who we found out was associated with even more shifty dudes. Yeah, Imad Saba was a serial founder of airlines, many of which only existed on paper, and all of which were based in countries with no state capacity to provide oversight. Hmm. Remember the first 727 that UTA leased, registration 3X-ray Golf Delta Mike? Well, that plane was never seen again. But the registration turned up again shortly afterwards, attached to an Antonov AN-12 belonging to a nominally Cambodia-based company called President Airlines which is really weird because 3X-ray is a Guinean registration code. Um, also, airplanes belonging to this supposedly Cambodian airline were frequently seen in, Char in Sharjah, um, where Iman Saba reportedly lived. Huh, interesting. Um, another of Iman Saba's business ventures was a company called East Slash West Cargo. This airline had a fleet of IL-76 freighters, one of which crashed in 2005 while running humanitarian aid into Darfur out of Sharjah, um, killing all seven crew. But do you know what else is interesting about East-West Cargo is that it is was identified as one of the airlines in the network of notorious Russian arms dealer Victor Bout. Next slide. Now you may have heard of this guy. Not pictured. Um, last year he was freed in a prisoner swap with Russia in exchange for US basketball player Brittany Greiner. <laughs> Isn't Victor Bout the inspiration for Yuri Orlov? Um, you know, from the 2005 film Lord of War, starring, as you can see here, none other than Sir Nicholas of Cage. Yeah, so so more or less, um, right? In reality, there, there are a couple of minor differences. Victor Bout was Russian. Orlov, uh, as depicted, was Ukrainian. However, uh, Bout was very much the merchant of death that we were portrays. In the movie, Orlov speaks half a dozen languages. He has ident identities in newer uh, companies and countries. He sold arbs to both sides of multiple conflicts and made the bulk of his fortune in sub-Saharan Africa um, and the African Middle East. Yeah, that sounds a lot like somebody, because between the breakup of the USSR's arrest in 2010, Victor Bout had his hands in pretty much every war on the planet. He sold arms to Liberian dictator Charles Taylor, the Taliban, the US in Iraq, Hezbollah, both sides of the Congolese Civil War, I mean everything. And the way he did it is he would found shitty little airlines in countries with no oversight, buy junker planes, and stuff them full of weapons. And these airlines would be constantly opening and shutting down, and Bout himself would frequently change his own residence and the place of registration of his companies, made him hard to track down. Meanwhile, Imad Saba was also connected to the arms trafficking industry, not only through East-West Cargo, but some of his other ventures as well. 
For example, he was also behind the defunct Armenia-based airline Air Van, which was shut down by Armenia for safety violations and cited by the United Nations for alleged arms smuggling to Liberia. Wait, didn't we just mention Liberia? Well, we don't actually fully know where the story goes from here. What this does tell us is that Imad Saba is a genuinely bad guy, unscrupulous, willing to dip his hands into extremely, wildly illegal shit. And we also know there are plenty of reasons an armed smuggler might be interested in flights between West Africa and Lebanon. <laughs> but whether there were ulterior motives behind the founding of UTA and Saba's financing thereof, we really can't say. So moving on very nervously, glancing over our shoulders. Next slide, please. Um, we will get into some of the sort of broader post-accident findings recommendations in the next section. But first, let's ask, did any of these scumbags suffer any sort of consequences for killing 140 people? Uh, <laughs> yeah, not... Mm, <laughs> no. Well, mm, no, 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 they didn't. In 2010, a court in Lebanon sentenced some people involved in this crash. One of them was the captain who got 20 years. He didn't really deserve punishment for this, but he fortunately... Augie Q forwarded himself back to Libya and has continued to do his thing. Last I heard, he kept flying for a Libyan airline called Rahila Air until he retired in 2019, which is fine. This crash wasn't his fault. Although, embarrassingly, he did kind of flee the scene in plain clothes, only to be recognized in the hospital. And there's a photo that Sam and I determined definitely shows the captain wearing the deceased first officer's flight jacket on the beach after the crash, which is weird. That's all I have to say about that. So, um, Imad Saba was also sentenced in absentia to three years in prison. He never showed up for his, for his trial, and his whereabouts since 2010 are unknown. Darwish Hazem was sentenced to 20 years in absentia, but he just chilled in Guinea, and he never served a day either. Um, in this case, he knew he was pretty dead to rights, which is why he, fleed, he fled immediately. He is the one on the CVR heard pressuring the captain to force the takeoff, despite the captain and the FO's very clear and understandable concerns. Yeah, Mohammed Khazem got six months, I believe, also in absentia. He just hung out with his brother Darwish. Um, Ahmed Khazem, the father, got one year and two months. He was the only one who's actually tried in person. Uh, at his trial, he had to be removed by security when the victims of families tried to beat his ass to death. And, you know, like, relatable, TBH. Yeah, we don't actually know if he went to prison or not. I sort of assume he maybe did, but we're not sure. So the grand total is that one member of the Kazam crime family possibly maybe served a year in prison. Justice? Maybe? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No, not so much. No. Oh, okay. All right. Next slide. So, the fuck did we learn? Let's talk a little about the findings and the recommendations. At the deepest level, this accident happened because there was next to no due diligence by any of the countries involved in the endeavor. The BEA recommended that Guinea create their own civil aviation bureaucracy, which is a much broader recommendation than I've ever seen in an accident report, which are normally a full of very specific mechanical or training-based recommendations and don't usually need to come stapled to a section for a 300-level undergrad poli side course on civil service. The BEA specifically called out that the UTA was able to move themselves from Sierra Leone to Guinea and sort of make up a transportation company based up around their family, all without raising any sort of suspicion. The report also calls out how long they were able to continue to operate in this level of criminality, in the absence of any kind of written contracts for operations with outside vendors, choosing instead to pay for things with cash. They don't just call out the, Guine the Guinean authorities. Sierra Leone and Lebanon are also both called out by name as well. Actually, the BEA praises Lebanon for being the grown-up in the room and insisting on the bare minimum level of maintenance, which is kind of impressive. This is Lebanon, after all. When you're worse at maintenance than Lebanon, wow. Wow. Yeah, so the BEA made a, a, an even higher level recommendation. They recommended to I, the ICAO, which is the UN organization governing aviation, that they act more aggressively in pushing countries to comply with international standards. Basically, countries are supposed to recognize and honor the inspection and certification of each other's aircraft, but they're not actually required to. Obviously, the U.S. does not demand an inspection of every British Airways jet that lands here, but we do have the right to do so and vice versa. And the report recommends that countries have an obligation not to just blindly sign off on flights and routes just because another country has said that the paperwork was in order, because in this case, it very clearly was not. Yeah. So as a concluding note, 
there are a lot of crashes that have happened because of cost cutting, but this accident is in a different universe entirely. This was an overtly slimy operation that shouldn't have been allowed to run a corner store, let alone an airline, and is only able to do so by operating in the shadows in a part of the world destroyed by colonialism. The official report for this is wild enough on its own, but the more we dug into this crash, the worse it became, and if we had done another month of research, we probably could have found even more criminality. So, I mean, in fact, we've been adding new findings to the script until literally today, the day we're recording. The fact that the victims of this crash were mostly poor workers just trying to get home for the holiday makes this crash even more upsetting. But on the other hand, 20 years have elapsed since the disaster, and the world is just different enough to mean that you might not be able to get away with shit like this today for as long. So it's it's less likely that something like this is going to happen again, hopefully. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts? All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, our Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Our next episode will be on Malaysia Air 370. Bye. 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 Bye.